On a defense that struggled at times, still Chambers was one of the bright spots for the Buckeyes defense in 2021. And this makes me wonder, what are the possibilities of Steel Chambers getting drafted in next year's draft? Where will he fall? We'll discuss this and a whole lot more about Steel Chambers and what the film says about his play right here on Locked on Buckeyes. You are Locked on Buckeyes, your daily podcast on the Ohio State Buckeyes. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, Buckeye fans? Welcome back to another episode of Locked On Buckeyes for the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jay Stevens, also the host of the Jay Stevens Podcast. It is Thursday, July 21st in the year 2022, and we heard him, or maybe you saw him on YouTube yesterday on this channel. He is back with us here again today. It's Ryan Roberts from Rise and Draft Scouting. He does recruiting for Irish Breakdown, and he has his own podcast. Well, it's not his, but he says it's his podcast covering the NFL Draft. Ryan Roberts, welcome back to the podcast. D-line yesterday. Today is all about the linebackers at Ohio State. Yeah, Jay. I, I appreciate you again, man, as always, for having me back. Linebackers is my favorite position to evaluate. It's the position I played, so I am very critical, I guess is a good word to say about linebacker play. I, I'm very picky when it comes to what I look for when I watch linebackers play football. So I'm excited to, to break this one down because there is one guy I'm excited about in this group, but uh, don't want to don't wanna, you know, give any uh, give anything away early on in the podcast. So let's take a little time out. We're not going to end the show, but Ryan just said something that I had not known at all. And he said that yeah. he played linebacker when he played football. Yes. Middle linebacker, Mike, Will, Sam. Where were you, Ryan? I played a Will. And um, so in high school, I played in, we played a 5 2, um, which is basically a, a bastardized like a 3 4. Defense, bro. It really was, man. But hey, it worked out. So it was a bastardized 3 4. So I played Sam Backer in that system. Okay. So I was okay. up on the line of scrimmage mostly. But then I played at Frostburg State where they, we ran a 4 2 5. And then I was the Will linebacker in the 4 2 5. 5 2? That was high school, right? <laughs> Yeah, man. Hey, I played a, a group of one school, which is the lowest classification in New Jersey. So nobody was throwing the football. So you're going to put five guys on the line of scrimmage. I, the most I had to do in coverage was I would drop to the flat occasionally, in a, in, depending on what the call was. So, How are those coverage skills? Uh, I mean, not great. They were fine. I mean, I didn't give up okay. any catches, but I probably dropped about six times in my high school career. So, you know. Okay. 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 <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. When I was in high school, we ran a 4-4. And I was like, okay, like this is different. Like I knew in like middle school, I think we ran like I didn't start playing football until I was in middle school. And my dad recently told me I had to get talked into playing football. Like I played rec league basketball, rec league soccer, football, absolutely not. And then a family friend talked me into playing football. And I played from seventh grade up until I graduated high school um in 2007. And so we played a 4-4, four four, and I was like, this is different. Like, NFL, they normally mm -hmm. have three linebackers. I knew college – I was getting into college football, so the college game was different. So I wasn't sure what the 4-4 four four was, but I liked the variation. I started to play NCAA football, and I really took that 4-4, four four, found um, the two inside backer blitz, and used that the entire time. <laughs> it worked on the computer. Didn't work against my buddies that I played against. I like the 4-4. Four four. The 5-2 works, honestly. If we saw – like. That's perfect for a lot of high schools, especially lower level high schools when like you don't have like the talent that the bigger schools have and the size nah. the bigger schools have. Just put five guys up there. You can't run the ball. Make it hard to run the ball. Make it hard to block. And well, you guys might win the game because of your different style of defense. Yeah, we uh, we played a lot of teams that were like triple option or single wing or double yeah, yeah. wing. Like nobody was throwing the football, man. Like spread offense was not. I mean, there was like one team on our. I think on our. There's probably one team on our schedule, I think, that ran any type of spread offense. Like, there was just nobody throwing the football. So, like, hey, let's get eight in the box and let's play football, you know? Like, that's what it was. So, it was a fun time, though. Fun time. It's, it's, uh, it's you know, it's become a little spread too spread out for my taste. I was like the – my coverage was okay, man. Like, when I was in college, it was fine. But I, I wanted to get downhill and, and play in the box, you know? Like, I didn't, I didn't want to mess around with playing in space a ton, you know? So <laughs> – 
Football's always fun. I I, I always yeah. reminisce about my football days. A guy on Facebook recently ended up taking a picture of his son wearing my buddies who graduated the same year, his high school jersey. And he said, hey, son, put this jersey on. He got the pads on his son and then put his, had his son's helmet on. And I was like, that's actually a dress on your son because of how big the jersey is. <laughs> but, I mean, it's not a bad look. And we weren't supposed to take our jerseys. A lot of us knew the school was going to get new jerseys mm. after we graduated. So I have my one of my jerseys in my closet. If I could have gotten the second one, I would. But, I mean, those jerseys were clean, but high school football is fun. Like, I really enjoyed time, my time playing high school football. Wasn't the best athlete. I would never say that. But just the team, the teamwork, the being with the guys, locker room stuff, all of that stuff is fun. Those are stories we'll talk about for years and years to come. 100%. I'm about to call your former high school and let them know that you took a jersey, by the way. I'm about to, about to let the cat out of the bag on that one. <laughs> they don't go back. Things- Certain things I should keep to myself, and that was one of them. <laughs> one thing I would not keep to myself, I know Ryan cannot, is discuss what we saw last year from the Ohio State linebackers. We talked about the defensive line specifically and highlighted what Ryan saw while he's scouting and watching the film on the Ohio State D line from last season. Let's do the same thing right now. Ryan, what did you see from this group, the linebacker group at Ohio State in 2021? Frustration, I guess, is is the best way. I mean, literally, your best linebacker was a running back to begin the year, right? Like, he was a guy that I think went – you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, Jay, but I think Steel Chambers went into fall camp as a running back, right? Like, he, the linebacker transition didn't happen until fall camp, if I remember correctly. So, literally, the best linebacker on the team last year was not originally supposed to be a linebacker for Ohio State, which is a very odd thing because, I mean, you were coming off of – I loved Pete Werner, right? Like, I was a huge Pete Werner guy. He had a great rookie year. Pete Werner was a good player. I wasn't the biggest Baron Browning fan of all time, but, like, he played that, you know, he was kind of like that rover in the 4-2-5, like that display Sam. Like, he played that role very well. And even Tough Borland, who, you know, we joked about a little bit. He was rock solid comparatively to the rest of the guys that were around him. So, linebacker play at Ohio State had been pretty good. You know, even working back to guys like, Jerome Baker and Raekwon McMillan and all these, I mean, some good linebackers that have come through Ohio State. Last year, sort of like the D-line that we talked about yesterday, was not what you would typically expect at Ohio State playing linebacker, right? So there was a lot of up and down play, but there was a little bit of excitement because there are a couple guys on this team, I think, especially younger guys, that you can get really excited about. And there's a great, obviously, freshman class coming in of linebackers from the recruiting side. You have still Chambers coming into his first real true full season as a linebacker after getting put into into uh into the fire last year as a guy that transferred over from running back or um sorry switched over from running back. So I think there's some positives to it. It's just last year was definitely not up to caliber uh, or up to up to up to up to snuff as far as what you would usually consider Ohio State linebacker play. If we're being honest again, it's one of the weirdest things to think about. And I was talking to. It wasn't you. It was somebody else. We were just talking about how Ohio State has a long history of Mm -hmm. really good linebacker play. I'm not just talking about, like, all Americans, but those are definitely guys that are on this list. But you can go back for years and decades and think about really good linebacker play. Didn't matter who the coach was. The linebacker play and the elite linebacker play was always there. And these guys not do it one year to the next year to the next year to getting a draft in the NFL. Mm -hmm. For some reason, Ryan, and it's not just last year, I think it may be something with Ryan Day where he's just trying to figure out, like, properly how to re- let his coaches recruit things. He's a new coach, and so I have to, like, cut him some slack a little bit, but also realize you're the coach of the Buckeyes, and the standards is, is extremely high. Something yeah. with the linebacker play at Ohio State over the past couple years, three years, it just has been a little odd, really weird. And I'm not even knocking tough. Like, you mentioned tough Borland. He gets knocked a lot. Tough Borland did what he can do. He did his with job. With his talent, with his talent he, level, 100%. He had his 100%. ceiling, and we all knew his ceiling. He did what he could do with his talent. But it's just something weird about the linebacker play and linebackers at Ohio State. And to think that last offseason, you knew a guy you possibly was – well, I think there was rumblings about it in July last year, Ryan. Mm-hmm. But you knew Steel Chambers might go to linebacker. Sure. But you also know. You have no idea what this kid's going to do when he plays linebacker because, well, he hasn't played linebacker since high school. And it's just weird to think about 
the success at this position for a really long time hasn't been here lately. Steel Chambers could be starting something and re and creating and getting back into the trend of elite linebacker play at Ohio State. I don't want to say elite. I don't, I don't know, but maybe we could see elite play from him at linebacker in the upcoming season. Well, I, I hope so, man, because like you said, I mean, it's a long it's a long and great tradition. I mean, you're talking about guys like James Laurinaitis and A.J. Hawk and Mike Vrabel, and there's been a lot of really good linebackers that have come through Ohio State. And it's one of those things as like, you know, from a scouting perspective, you always expect it to be there too, right? So it's like that's a com- that, that's why the next Ohio State corner is always the next big guy, right? Because it's just tradition. It's what usually happens. So I'm very hopeful for Steel Chambers. I am. I know we're going to go a little more in depth on him, but there were a lot of really good flashes, obviously, last year in his first year as a starter. A guy that I really liked coming out of high school as a running back. <laughs> like, I really liked Steel Chambers. I thought he was going to be a really good running back at the college level, and obviously he took that step forward and showed a lot of good stuff. And I think that there's some optimism there because you're expecting him to take a big step. And the thing is, Jay, is like as long as they are developing them better, I mean – we're going to talk about guys like Tommy Eichenberg, right, and Cody Simon, and then obviously the freshman I talked about, like C.J. Hicks's of the world. There's a lot of highly recruited players there, right? So, like, there is talent. There's no doubt about it. It needs to be developed better, and obviously you're breaking in a new linebacker coach. Obviously, Al Washington left Ohio State, and that is now over at Notre Dame. So, new linebacker coach, new terminology, Jim Knowles defense. I'm very hopeful that Ohio State's going to turn around at the linebacker position because we have seen a proud, proud tradition at the at the spot for Ohio State over the years. We've mentioned his name a couple of times, probably more mm-hmm. than a couple. Let's go ahead and get right into it, Ryan. Steel Chambers, what did you see in the film? I mean, you see a great athlete. I mean, there's no doubt about it, right? Like he's 6'1", about 232 pounds, somewhere in that ballpark. And I think he's going to run a legit like 4'5", maybe even 4'4 high. Like he's a really, really explosive and good athlete, man. He, Even though he probably projects best as a wool linebacker. I also think that he could play Mike eventually because he's got a pretty... I think he could too. I really do. I think he's got a dense frame, right? Like he's got some physicality to him. Right now he's going through every transition that you would expect or tough transition that you would expect from a running back going into a linebacker. He's never done it before, right? Like there's... The thing about linebacker is that it's a very disciplined position, right? Yes. And... As your eyes and your feel for the game get better, that's when you really unlock the athleticism, right? Like, I see a lot of guys that just kind of run around aimlessly. Like, I I wasn't a big Quay Walker fan that went in the first round last year out of Georgia because I felt like his eyes weren't great. He was just kind of an aimless runner. As Steel Chambers improves his eye discipline and his instincts to as a traditional run filler – you're going to see him be able to unlock his athleticism even more because you saw it in flashes last year. Like there's some plays that he does, especially in pursuit and working in space where you're just like, oh, that's 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 a pretty rare thing. Like that's an unordinary thing. Like that is what you would expect out of a former running back play in the position. And he has enough physicality. Like he's not afraid to put his put his head in the in, in there, you know, and the really really show his aggressiveness as a football player. There's no doubt about it. So I have the makings of a really good linebacker because he's athletic, he's explosive, he's dense, and he has physicality to him. But everything's new. So everything is, there's some times where he's just a step slow. There's some times where an angle isn't great. It's the finer points of playing linebacker that needs to get better, obviously, for a steel chairs, which you would expect. I haven't only played the position for not even a full calendar year. But the fact of the matter is, is that the upside is insane with this kid. Like, this kid could be one of the next highly drafted linebackers coming out of Ohio State. Because right now he's, what was he, was he, a, uh, he was, he's going to be a fourth year junior this year. So he still has multiple years of eligibility. Is he going to be in the 2023 class? We'll see. I mean, I think it could happen because I think that he could take a step forward where he's one of the more highly touted linebackers in this class. It's very possible. So I see an incredible athlete, dense build. It's just all about the finer points of playing the position because he just hasn't been doing it very long. Can you describe, I know you did a little bit there, but Ohio State has another guy who transferred from Arizona State, Chip Mm -hmm. Trainum, Diamante's his real first name, Chip's his his nickname, who was a running back. It is now transferring to Ohio State to play linebacker. I didn't think the Buckeyes would see this transition from two players in back-to-back seasons. And I find it very – you talk about the discipline. 
you can use some of those things that you have and you use as a running back at linebacker, mm-hmm. but that discipline you need at linebacker is it's going to make or break you. Like, it could easily get you on the field. If you're disciplined, it could keep you off the field if you're not disciplined. It's really, really tricky. But that transition, could you go a little bit more in depth about how difficult or maybe easy that transition is? Well, I, I, I think that that Ohio State is making that transition for a couple guys because they – I think that they saw that there was a need to get faster on the second level, right? Because, I mean, we're going to talk about guys like Tommy Eichenberg and Cody Simon who are solid athletes, but they're not incredible athletes. But a guy like a Steel Chambers, who I already talked about, is an exceptional athlete. There's no doubt. Chip Trainum is an exceptional athlete. Like, he's a smaller kid, about 5'11", 227, somewhere in that ballpark, but he's probably a 4'5 athlete, right? Like, he's that type of dude. And I think that Ohio State has made those transitions because they're just trying to get a lot more explosive on the second level because I just don't think that's something that they have otherwise on the roster. But it's a – it's I wouldn't say it's a natural thing because, like you said, Steele has played a little bit of linebacker in, in his career. But it's a – usually you'll see running backs at lower levels in high school also play linebacker. Like that's usually a pretty comparable skill set because mm-hmm. you're mm-hmm. dense, you're physical, you're – working, you know, kind of downhill. So, like, there are some attributes that I think do translate well from a running back to a linebacker. But the the fact of the matter is is that anytime you're going from an offensive position to a defensive position, that is a big transition, man. Like, it is. I mean, let's call it what it is. So that's why I was overly impressed by what I saw from Steel Chambers because I was like, wow, this kid hasn't been doing this very long, and he's making plays, right? So, like, there are – some big upside to that sense. He's only going to get smarter. He's only going to get better with his eye discipline. He's only going to get better with his trigger. Like everything is just going to become more natural. So I think there are some tangibly some things, Jay, that you do look at and say like from a body type perspective, from an athleticism perspective, like it makes sense for the transition. But anytime you're transitioning from one side of the football to the next, it's something that's going to take a little bit of time for sure. If Chambers comes out and enters the NFL draft, at the end of this year, yep. where do you kind of project him falling in the spring of next year? Look, if he's the same exact player that he was last year, then he's going to be a day three uh, dart throw, right? Okay. Like somebody, okay. somebody in like the fourth, fifth, sixth round, whatever it might be, is going to say traits. And also the big thing that I didn't even mention is that one thing that is working in Steel Chambers' favor is that a team is going to look at him and say, I, I can teach him what to do as far as, as a as – a, from a defensive uh, perspective, but until he is that player that I want to see, I am going to make him a special team stalwart. And he's going to be a really good special teamer. Okay, okay. Because he's 6'1", 234, and can run. Like, those things translate to playing special teams on next level. So that gives him some stay power. So at worst, I think it's a day three dart throw because he has upside and he's going to be a special teams player. At best, I mean, if this kid takes a huge step, I wouldn't say day two's out of the question, man. Like I wouldn't really? say it. I mean, he's Jay. I mean, it's it's it looks like a pretty good linebacker group early, right? Like I mean, we're looking at guys like Trenton Simpson from Clemson, who I'm a big fan of, and I mean, there's guys, man. Like I mean, I'm just pulling up a list, and like there's there's some guys that you get excited about, like Noah Sewell from Oregon and Henry Toto from Alabama. Like it's a pretty decent linebacker group, but. I mean, after that, you're talking about a lot of guys that are projection-based right now. So if you're telling me there's a lot of projection, I'm going to tell you that he has as good a chance as anybody as far as far as his steel chambers because he has some insane traits to work with. So I think that it's very possible that you could be looking at a player and say, that kid could be a third-round pick if he takes a step forward because the athleticism is definitely on par for a day-two player because, I mean – those traits that made him a once lofty running back recruits are what people want on the second level in the NFL. Like that explosiveness, that physicality, th- those are things that the NFL is really going to like, in my opinion. Let's keep going. Number two on our list is Tommy Eichenberg, who many people believe will be the starting Mike linebacker for the Buckeyes this year. What yep. do you see with this young man? I see a little better version at his peak than a – Tough Borlands, just a little bit. I mean, because, like, he's a little bigger, a little denser. Of course, he was a four-star recruit. His brother is is um, is um, Liam Eichenberg that played at Ohio State and is now playing in the NFL for the Miami Dolphins. So he has NFL bloodlines. He has some physicality. The biggest thing, Jay, is that he's going to run into the, into the conversation where 
you're a just a true run stopper, right? Like he's not a great athlete on the second level. So he's never going to be an asset as far as I'm, in my opinion, in pass coverage. Could it be passable? Maybe. But like right now, I don't think he's a draftable player just because I think there is a lot of athletic limitations. But I think he has some physicality and he has decent eyes as far as his ability as a run fitter. So I think he's going to be a good college linebacker. I'm just not so sure I see NFL linebacker right now unless he takes a huge step. Really? Mm-hmm. Really? <laughs> I'm just pushing your buttons right now. I'm trying to get some huh? more out of you. I mean, because what is he? Is he 6'2", 235? Yeah, something like that. Es- estimate him running in the four sevens. Like, he's just a little bit of an average physical profile for the next level. So, I mean, could he stick as a UDFA or maybe slip somewhere into late day three? I guess it's possible, but, I mean, you, I just need to see a whole lot more from him. He's going to be a fourth-year junior, so he's got multiple years of eligibility. I would personally be surprised if he was in the 2023 NFL draft cycle if we're just talking – you know, just kind of projection yeah. based, right? Like, I mean, even if yeah. he leaves the team in tackles, he still strikes me as a kid that's probably going to go back for another year. Is he a three down backer? Could he play first, second, and third? First, second down, down I would say. You know, he's he's more of a run stopper than a true guy, a guy that could play in space a ton. And I would also say, for me, like I've talked to a lot of people on the NFL level, scouts that are. They've kind of thrown out that adage of like a two down run stopper now, right? With how the NFL is working now, it's kind of a one down position. If we're yeah, being yeah, honest, yeah. like that's how that's why so many teams are now just running two linebacker sets most of the time, right? So it's getting a little tougher for guys like Tommy Eichenberg, but if for him, it's going to be about consistency and physicality because I just don't think he's an athlete. I, I don't think he's athletic enough to be an asset in passing downs, unfortunately. So what I'm hearing, which is could be a luxury for the Buckeyes. When Ohio State plays Wisconsin and Braylon Allen is on the field, that could be where Eichenberg kind of flourishes during this season. Sure. Sure. I mean, I mean, you need all your help you can get against that kid, man, because he's a 6'2, 240-pound line uh, running back that is also a guy that could probably play linebacker. He's a he's a physically dense dude. So hey man, and and that's the separation, I think, between the NFL draft and college football. Like, there's a lot of linebackers in the college level that are really good players. It's just Sometimes their skill sets just don't necessarily trans- translate. So I think Tommy Eichenberg could be a really good linebacker on, on the college level, though. I think there's no doubt. It's just there's some athletic limitations, in my opinion. What's the realistic – what's one realistic thing you think he can work on right now to get better come in the fall? Well, I mean, any, th- any plus that he can show in the passing game is huge. So, that, I mean, that could be multiple things. It could be increasing flexibility in the offseason so he changes direction a little better. It could be just eye discipline and ability to close down zones with, with just his eyes and, and the um, intangibles that he has in that department. So, I, I think that there's some things he can do. I just – I. I I just see a little bit of a tight athlete, right? Like, I think he's a little bit linear. If he's able to show that he can change direction and just do a little bit in the passing game, then you might change my opinion a little bit. But I I just – I don't see him taking a big enough jump in that department to become an asset necessarily. Last but not least, there's another guy here. Now, this one is draft eligible. But from everything that I'm reading and seeing even in what I watched during the spring game, Cody Simon's not going to start, and what it's the way that I think Jim Knowles is going to run this defense. Simon might play a little bit, mm-hmm. but it's going to be hard for him to get on the field consistently enough, especially to wow NFL scouts and executives getting going into the next year's NFL draft with Cody yep. Simon. He's third on the list for a reason. What do you see? I mean, he's a third-year junior coming up here, right? So he's definitely a guy that I think is not going to be in the 2023 NFL draft. We'll see, we'll see what happens eventually. But I think for me, he's a little more athletic than Tommy Eichenberg. They're roughly about the same size. Cody's listed like 6'2", 233-ish, somewhere in that ballpark. And he has a little more looseness as an athlete. But he also isn't quite the physical player that Tommy Eichenberg is, right? So right, you're kind right. of – you're kind of – you're trading one for the other a little bit. But, I mean, he was at one time a – top 100 linebacker recruit. His brother played linebacker at Notre Dame as well. So I think that there is something potentially there. It's just he's going to be in a funky spot, though, Jay, honestly, because you're talking about Steel Chambers and Tommy Eichenberg, guys that are a little older than him that have kind of assumed roles. And then you have C.J. Hicks and Gabe Powers and Reed Carrico and, like, all those dudes. He's going to be in a tough spot, man, because he's going to have to fend off some really talented young linebackers as kind of being in that, like, middle age right now on the field. So he's going to have to take a step forward, but I don't, I don't think that you're going to see enough of him, unfortunately for him to be a guy that's going to seriously consider entering the draft early. Right. Let's think about this though. And I'm not trying to knock sign as a player, 
But it's sure. kind of just kind of talking about how an NFL scout and going to the draft will look at it and how Ohio State fans will look at it and kind of projecting what Simon might do on the field. Ohio State's going to run two linebackers um, weak side, which weak side will be the will will be Chambers, the Mike will be Eichberg. In rare occasions where they're running a three backer set, Sam Backer's going to be, from what I'm reading and hearing, is going to be Reed Carrico. It's not Cody Simon. And so you yeah. have a younger guy who's been there last year, kind of got his feet wet um, with the Buckeye program, who is projected to be the Sam Backer when the Buckeyes need three backers on the field. You mm -hmm. might say, Jay, why is Simon not there? Well, clearly, Carrico showed enough flashes in practice to bump himself up on that depth chart over Simon. And so we talk about the NFL draft aspect. That's great what projections might be. But even right now in college football, he's not showing enough progression to overcome and get on the field, maybe at a different position, over a guy who's younger than him, who has shown enough in practice to say, well, three back are set, Reed Carrico, second year, you're the guy. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's tough, man, because, I mean, unfortunately for Cody, I said he's a, he's a little better athlete than Tommy Eichenberg, a little more flexible, but he just – that's Sam Backer spot. Like, you need to work in space a ton, right? Yeah, like, you're buddy. you're yeah, you're, an, oh, you're an overhang defender. So, I think Reed is just a little bit more of a high-caliber ca athlete than a Cody Simon is. So, unfortunately, he maybe just doesn't fit that mold. So, he's getting kind of put behind guys, like, again, like a Steel Chambers, like a – Tommy Eichenberg, guys that are more inside linebacker types than what than a, a Sam Backer would be in today's game. So unfortunately, he's just in a spot where there's a lot of competition. And Rick Carrico, fortunately for him, he fits kind of that Sam Backer role that we saw Baron Browning and, and Pete Werner before him play. Ryan, it's always fun having you on. I do believe we could get you back once again for DB sometime down the road to discuss guys like Ronnie Hickman. Tanner McAllister and those players that'll be playing at Ohio State in the upcoming season. Ryan, if you could let everyone know where they can follow you on Twitter and then everything you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you again for having me on. It's Rise and Draft on Twitter. You can follow everything that I do out there as far as the NFL draft space. So it's riseanddraft.com. We have one stop shop for all draft nerds out there. You want prospect database, some podcasts. NFL draft, uh, mock draft simulator. We got a little bit of everything over there. And you'd also check out on the site is the podcast, Believe in NFL Draft Prospect Podcast, where we have some player interviews as well as instant analysis. We're doing the uh, the summer, summer scouting portion of the set cycle now. So if you want to check in on some linebacker play, which we talked about today, make sure to check out this week. And then also Ohio State is playing on Notre Dame in the first game of the season. So you can go check out irishbreakdown.com if you want a little bit of an insight into what Notre Dame's doing, what they have cooking, what their offense might look like, what their defense might look like, all that good stuff. Make sure to check out irishbreakdown.com. And, guys, you can follow me on Twitter at jstevens07. You can send all of your emails to jstevens317 at gmail.com. Do something for me in the YouTube comments. Let me know if you want an early look at the Fighting Irish. I could talk to Ryan and try to connect with somebody to get an early look as far as what the Irish are going to bring to the table during week one. If you guys want a preview, I'll try to make it happen, try to get some connections, to get somebody on the show to do that very thing. We're out of here on this Thursday. One more day. Tomorrow, we're continuing our Ohio State Buckeye draft where we're celebrating 20 years of success. Tomorrow, we're drafting wide receivers, the best Buckeye receivers of the past 20 years. Ryan, I'm putting you on the spot. It just wasn't planned. Um, but let's leave the people with this. Who do you think would be your top two Buckeye receivers of the past 20 years going back to the 2002 season? Wow, that's a that's a loaded question. Um, Michael Jenkins was one okay. that I really liked. Uh, I liked Michael Jenkins a ton, and I mean, I think it's Garrett Wilson, but I'm sure some people would say maybe Jackson Smith and Jake has a chance to be that guy. But we'll see. Last thing for you is Antonio Holmes in your top five. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, San Antonio. I mean, otherwise than that, I mean, I'm thinking Michael Jenkins, San Antonio Holmes for sure. Maybe Ted Ginn might sneak in there even though he was more of a punt returner, in my opinion. Like, he was more of a return specialist than a true wide receiver. But I think he would definitely be in there. There's a, it, might, it must be nice, man, to have all these great receivers, <laughs> though, where you can just kind of – I mean, you might have an honorable mention with about 20 guys. So it must be nice. It is nice. It's also nice that this show is over and we're going to be out of here just – just here shortly. Be back tomorrow, guys. This receiver draft will be a lot of fun. A little fun with Ryan at the end of today's show. Ryan will be back maybe next week. I'll be back tomorrow. Have a great day.